I'm a believer in uh, Aldous Huxley's concept around the brain kind of just being this redu reduction valve, kind of making sense of this world, not just the brain, but some, our senses. Um, but there's a lot of intelligence that exists out there and a lot of information that we're just like not privy to really understanding. Welcome to the multiverse, where we believe that mushrooms can actually save the world. Each week, we'll be meeting with thought leaders and experts to extract the best insights and stories across everything from functional fungi, psychedelic medicine, and so much more. Thanks for listening. Step into the multiverse with us. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Into the Multiverse. I'm really excited because today we have a friend of mine, Greg Cuban, and Greg is the co-founder of SciMed and also the host of one of my favorite psychedelic podcasts, Business Trip FM. So Greg, thank you so much for joining us today. I have a bazillion things that I want to ask you about, but mm -hmm. first of all, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to a interesting conversation. I'm always really excited when I get to interview hosts and um, or just talk to other hosts of podcasts. There are mm -hmm. some of my favorite episodes because you're such an expert question asker. So mm -hmm. um, I have a long list of questions that I hope, you know, amount to the usual standard that you have for your episodes. All right. I want to start with, I have, I have three comments that I think will be like a really good way to introduce you. Mm -hmm. um, I love to, I told you this before, right before we started recording, but I love to do a a good deep stock of everyone before, mm -hmm. before they come on. And three things that I found and slash remembered is we had a dinner series over the summer and we had an event. It was around the future of psychedelic wellness. We went around the table and it was a collection of thought leaders in the space and asked them what was most present for them. And I don't know if you remember what you said, but we had some notes on your answers and I had to go back and, and remember, but you said two things. One is you welcome consistent mind explosion. That was like the quote that we wrote down from you. And number two is you would love to see a podcast that interviews people in the spirit realm. The third thing that I think is just like a fun way to intro you is I went to your Twitter page and the thing that you have pinned to the top of your Twitter page <laughs> is what do you call a group of Greg's, a congregation? So I think those three things are kind of like a trifecta and I, I just want to dive into them more. So as by way of introduction, can mm. you kind of explain what, you know, you don't need to explain the the congregation, but what the what the spirit realm podcast and um, what consistent mind explosion means to you? Sure, love the great first question. Um, <laughs> so on the mind explosion side of things, uh, I love creativity. I love thinking outside of the box, um, and. Um, I find, I think that that's actually kind of what has drawn me to the world of entrepreneurship, but, uh, in, uh, but also the world of psychedelics. Uh, I find that on the psych, on the entrepreneurship side of things, um, when I think about a, the formation of a new company, it often requires, uh, an idea that is, that has not been conceived of before, not been executed on before. And so, uh, oftentimes, you know, when I'm sitting around thinking of ideas, sometimes they're business ideas, sometimes they're art ideas. It's just, there's, there's this idea of just, uh, you know, um, in my mind, just, uh, the brainstorm. I just love it. I love the brainstorm. And so, uh, I think that's a, a piece of that answer. Um, and um, as we know, on the psychedelic side of things, uh, there are many types of psychedelic experiences that result in the connection of various parts of our brain that don't normally talk to each other. And as such, we're able to uh, generate, I think, a fair amount of creativity. Um, and so that's, that, I think that's, that, that's uh, one way to explain that. Um, we probably could have a whole other episode if we really wanted to go deep uh, on other dimensions there. Uh, on the spiritual side, um, yeah, I, as I'm saying this, I'm looking at the book Untethered Soul on your bookshelf. Um, <laughs> and I think that spirituality and, and the, 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 that world uh, of mysticism, if you will, is just generally not well understood, both by myself and I think 
uh, the vast majority of people on earth at this point in time. And so, yeah, my comment was really just around my own personal interest in uh, continuing to explore that world and realizing that a podcast is a great opportunity to do so because you can speak with experts and people who have been living that life, uh, exploring it, living um, spiritually. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really, I'm interested in going deeper there. And so um, I think a podcast could be a really interesting way to do so. Maybe Business Trip FN takes a pivot. What I, what I took the comment as, we ha- I had a debate with someone on my team. I fully thought you were talking about you would love to have a podcast where while under the influence of psychedelics, mm-hmm. you were, you know, being interviewed mm. or having a conversation with the, you know, different counterparts, yeah. kind of just recording the experience. So yeah. I've, um, con- I've considered that. So that's not wrong. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Well, maybe b- both need to happen. Yeah. Okay. I've, so I've also considered live streaming it, which I think really takes it to another place, mm. but we can discuss that later. I've heard. I don't know if this is accurate or not. Yeah. I've heard that there's a few Netflix shows underway mm. that are actually documenting the process mm-hmm. a little bit more. Mm-hmm. So I think a part of the fear of psychedelics is is diffused by really kind of witnessing firsthand mm-hmm. what, you know, a lot of people when they take mushrooms for the first time or any other psychedelic, they just say, oh, this yeah. is what I was so scared of. Yeah. So I think, you know, normal. we'll talk more about, you know, the process of normalizing it and how important that is later. But um, hopefully more of that content is coming to the light. Totally. Yes. Uh, my concluding thought though, on, on the spirit podcast is, you know, I I do have the belief that we are spiritual beings and, um, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm interested in, in finding that connection point between our souls and our mind and our body and that alignment. And so, um, you know, I think that there's, there's a lot to explore there and a lot to, to learn um, that I think actually can make us healthier um, and, 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 and more understood. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. I'd love to listen to the episodes whenever they come out. All right, let's do it. <laughs> um, so also a part of my deep stalking yeah. was I, my favorite thing to do is, is to go back and look at LinkedIn profiles. Mm. And it's really funny because, you know, LinkedIn or any sort of resume just has these moment in time kind of statements yeah. with no real explanation of how the gap was closed. Mm. And so looking back at the very first thing on your LinkedIn profile, yeah. how did you go from being an analyst yeah. at Morgan Stanley yeah. to now being, you know, an emerging leader in the psychedelic space? It's a, it's been a long, strange path. Um, so yeah, my career has spanned from working at Morgan Stanley to working at MTV to starting a software company, uh, to now working in the psychedelic space, both through a podcast and through investing. So uh, disparate areas, I would say for sure. Um, When I actually reflect on my experience starting in finance uh, and banking, uh, I actually think in some ways, there's two competing thoughts. So on the one hand, I think it, deciding to do that was actually more of an ego-driven idea. Uh, and what I mean by that is at that time in my life, I was interested in working in a bank and in finance kind of because there was, at that time, there was social status associated with it. It was kind of what one did, at least in some of the circles that I was, I was in. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I kind of just followed that decision. Uh, now what the experience was like was interesting in that, um, I did, I was also interested in learning how a bank worked how finance worked. And I kind of intuitively knew that like our our whole global system is like fundamentally uh, rooted in economic structure and, um, well, part of it. And I want to just, I wanted to experience it. Um, but what's interesting is after my first year as an analyst, I had, a a, (laughs) Uh, review with my boss and he said uh that I was too cavalier and I was like cavalier like what do you mean is that is that a good thing he's like no that's not a good thing in this mm-hmm. environment uh like you this is uh, this is a hierarchical uh workplace where you need to like get an assignment you need to do what you're told to do and I just that didn't jive with me uh and I just kind of knew it so mm-hmm. when I think about that experience and reflecting on it I, I actually 
it was a data point for me to realize that I was better suited to do something on my own. Uh, and so when I think about the next progression, I worked at MTV. I was more in a strategy consulting group, was really able to be creative in that role, uh, but then got the entrepreneurial itch. Uh, so I started a software company, um, and uh, which is still in operation. And then from there, I kind of knew that uh, I was interested in business and startups and um, helping solve problems the way I was explaining before, but didn't feel the alignment, kind of like the soul alignment, going back to my earlier comment. Um, and I knew I wanted to participate in an area that I felt like really passionate, intuitively passionate about. And um, <clears throat> for about a few months, uh, both myself and Matthias, who is my co-host on Business Trip and also involved in SideMed, we, we really started to explore um, the, the latest research, uh, that was happening in and around psychedelics. Each of us have had our own, uh, say transformative experiences with the medicine and could speak from our own experiences of how, uh, beneficial psychedelics can be, um, both from a therapeutic standpoint, from a creative standpoint, from a consciousness exploration standpoint, from a spiritual standpoint. Um, but we were like, okay, uh, it feels like something potentially is happening in this space now that is moving away from it just being researched in select communities and happening underground in a therapeutic context and really starting, the, the chasm was being crossed and chasm crossed in that um, there, if there was enough research that supported the potential efficacy of psychedelics as medicine that really supported new businesses to be formed. Uh, and with the, the new business formation, can, you know, fast forward to where we are now, there's really a little industry that is, I think, only going to continue to grow over time. And so, yeah, I guess, long story short, I actually feel like the progression from working in a bank to doing what I'm doing now has been kind of almost an evolution of aligning with my ego to aligning with my soul. Ironically, mm -hmm. I'm working in a financial context in both uh, in both instances in that like I'm an investor now, too. So I've kind of gone full circle where I have learned certain concepts around um, how businesses capitalize and um, basically how how they are supposed to function, which I can now apply to what I'm doing, um, even though they're like very different worlds. It's interesting because I've had a few conversations about this exact topic recently of like, mm -hmm. who is, the, who is the most well-positioned people to scale, you know, psychedelic investment funds and mm -hmm. psychedelic companies. And it needs to be like a blend of, you know, both people who have deep experience and can understand like the roots of where mm -hmm. these medicines come from and also understand how to scale companies. Yeah. And, you know, there are so many wise, incredible people that know so much more than any, you know, any of us, any of you, any of you guys about the space, but they're not going to go build a company around it. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, how do you represent their voice and then blend it with people who have intel incredible business acumen? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's just an interesting, an interesting thing to think about. Yeah. So I do think you're uniquely qualified to kind of answer this question because, you know, I've listened to most of your episodes mm -hmm. on business trip and I think they're awesome and you've done so much research learning about the scope of the space. And, you know, you called it a little industry it used to be a little industry, but now it's this really, really, you know, it's, it's booming. There's over $2 billion of capital that have gone to psychedelic companies, mm -hmm. over a hundred for-profit companies. Mm -hmm. When I had Peyton on, um, a few weeks ago from Numinous, the founder of Numinous, he was talking about his experience, you know, when he first started talking about psychedelics, it was like this niche thing that no one really Mm -hmm. was interested in or cared about. And then now look at what's progressed in the space. But for people that are listening mm -hmm. that don't have an understanding, because you have, you know, in your podcast, you go into the nitty gritty of like all the details of, mm. you know, you know, the IPOs of, of some publicly traded psychedelic companies. But just for people that don't understand what's going on, can yeah. you just give a 10,000 foot view of what's happening in the psychedelic space? Let's go. Maybe we go up to 20,000. 20,000. Um, <laughs> so to trace it back, I think um, there has been a lot of activity around taking, I guess, going back um, 
Let me think of it. Let me think the, of, about the right starting place for this. It's kind of a big question. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> you okay. Could just talk no, for no it's good. Hour, it's but... good. Um, I think the the place I like to start often when I speak to people who are newer to the space is just like, okay, let's start first with like the therapeutic efficacy of psychedelics as medicine um, to actually explain like the mechanisms of action of like what is happening on the individual level. Right. And so I think about, you know, if to, to go broad, right. If you think about psilocybin, uh, what's really interesting there to me is its ability to, uh, help people see objectively um, about their current situation in, in where they're at. It helps to, um, you know, decrease the rumination that's taking place, which is something that is quite common in people who are depressed. Um, it, really allows people to, to process information in a more rapid way. Uh, and so as such, when you think about uh, large swaths of human beings who are depressed, it really allows them to um, work through it in a, it, it, work through it as a, basically in a much more effective way than, than without the, the medicine and also doing it with a therapist. Uh, and so um, it's this huge innovation uh, relative to antidepressants, which tend to just numb symptoms and not actually allow people to really treat and sometimes cure themselves. Um, similarly, on another track, MDMA, super interesting in the sense that um, it really does a few things to people's brains neurologically. We now know it decreases uh, fear activity in the brain. It heightens senses of connection. And so, um, you know, as such, it's really helpful to, uh, for people to process trauma. And so, um, and also with therapists in the room to actually help hold the space and work through stuff. And so, uh, currently there's really not great ways to, uh, to, for, for people who have PTSD to, to heal themselves. And this is this huge innovation. So when I think about, you know, major depressive disorder or treatment resistant depression or, PTSD, these are major neuropsychiatric conditions that uh, currently are not addressed in our existing medical system. And so you have uh, these psychedelic therapies that are now being developed, these protocols, um, which uh, historically were only being tested and studied in university settings, in, in, in you know, research uh, settings, at least above ground, and but happening quote unquote, underground with thousands of therapists that were, you know, basically helping heal people, uh, but without any real data to support it. There, the, I think the inflection point that has happened is that there's been enough data that is demonstrable about the efficacy of these treatments that has inspired entrepreneurs to say, okay, we can actually build a business around this. Like if I can go and raise the funding required to uh, run a clinical study, a clinical trial, then I actually believe that there's a shot that the FDA is going to approve one of these treatments as a real therapeutic treatment. A really important caveat is that a lot of this groundwork was laid by MAPS. MAPS basically has been at this since 1986. Uh, they started doing their clinical trials in the early 2000s, um, and they. What's interesting there is that they were looking. They got donations instead of outside funders that had equity in these businesses. So Maps really led. Uh, I, I would say the the created the foundation to demonstrate with MDMA the potential efficacy. Then you've had businesses, Compass Pathways being one of the first to uh, that is doing psilocybin therapy uh, for uh, major uh, for treatment resistant depression. Um, and so I think what had ha then happened is that a lot of m more entrepreneurs started to catch a wind of like, whoa, there's a pathway here. Not only is there like these companies forming, important to note, a few of these companies have received breakthrough therapy designation, which the FDA only approves or, or provides uh, when there's a new therapy that is potentially uh, effectively way more effective than the existing standard of care. And they've granted that to a handful of these companies, which really demonstrates that there's a possibility that these companies will be approved. So I think the nature of entrepreneurship is such that when you start to see these data points, more people are like, hmm, maybe there's an opportunity to work with DMT. Maybe there's an opportunity to do microdosing. Maybe there's an opportunity to develop new chemical entities. And so 
Uh, as a result, as you mentioned, hundreds of companies are forming uh, that are uh, basically developing a variety of psychedelic uh, therapies. Some are assisted with therapists. Some are being designed to be take-home medicines, basically prescribable from a doctor. Um, and so that's, that's a lot of what's happening in what I like to think of the biopharma side of things. But then at the same time, you have um, a, uh, I guess, two important things to note. One is uh, what has been happening with ketamine. Uh, and that's interesting in that ketamine is already FDA approved, but for anesthetics, not for therapy. But we now know through a lot of clinical studies that have happened, ketamine is a super fast acting antidepressant. And at a higher dose, it can serve as a really, um, uh, uh, basically, it, it induces a psychedelic state such that it can be really helpful uh, in, in the context of, of psychotherapy. And so you have clinics that are now forming that are offering ketamine therapy. Um, and so that's happening really throughout the, the United States, Canada, a lot of Europe, and really now soon to be like beyond that. Um, and so that's kind of this little part of the industry that is forming that doesn't have to adhere to FDA clinical trials. So that's kind of taking off. And then in addition to that, you have what I like to think of as the infrastructure so type of companies. So those are companies that are maybe making software to help these clinics manage their, uh, their, their operations. Or that could be um, a virtual reality uh, app or experience where that effectively helps people be, prepare themselves for their first trip because a lot of people are really scared of the experience. And there's apps like Trip that basically can uh, prepare patients and individuals before uh, the experience to, to calm them down and get them more, more ready. So uh, that kind of falls into the boat of what I like to think of as digital therapeutics. Um, but yeah, so to make a very long story short, you have the biopharma side of things you have uh, that are going through clinical trials. You have the ketamine type of businesses. Uh, and then you have the infrastructure that's kind of uh, allowing the whole workflow to happen in a, or, or not workflow, but allowing the industry to function efficiently. I think that was one of the best descriptions I've heard. Okay. Great. So, and I think really helpful for someone who doesn't understand the why and the what yeah. of what's happening. Yeah. Um, and it, this is what, you know, understanding all of these different moving pieces is what led you to start. Simed. Yeah. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. I actually, I went on your website and read your kind of your ethos, I guess, yeah. around investing. I'd love to hear, you know, you speak about it more, but this is what's on your website. And it says, we are a community focused fund and syndicate that provides capital and support to the best and most innovative companies that align healing, responsibility, and profitability. We believe that psychedelic therapies will heal hundreds of millions of people. And my follow up question to that, mm -hmm. which kind of leads into like your overall ethos around investing is like, yeah. this is really important to call attention to the last sentence, mm. you know, depending on what study you look at mm -hmm. over 1 billion people globally suffer from some sort of a mental health disorder. Mm -hmm. And the claim of hundreds of millions of people is a huge chunk of that yeah. for one healing modality. Sure. So I agree with you um, for people that may not agree with you yeah. as of right now, what leads you and your team to believe that that's possible? So the question about the scale, how many people this could, yeah, could like, affect. Yeah, well, I think about the McDonald's billboard that showed like millions of served, millions served, then like hundreds of millions of served, then billions served. And so maybe that hundreds of millions will be billions at some mm -hmm. point in the next decade. Um, <laughs> You're following the McDonald's model, following, basically. Exactly. To, to uh, you know, I guess, fix, fix all the problems that McDonald's has caused. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly. Um, except the McDonald's sign, it'll be a big mushroom right. uh, on top. Right. Uh, put it if we there. just turned all the McDonald's signs into mushrooms, I think that would a lot of a lot of good would for a brand awareness that. perspective. That yes. would be great. Yes, I like it. Okay. Um. So yeah, in terms of my belief about the impact of, uh, I, I, there's a few parts to that question. So in terms of like how big this could become, uh, I think from a Western, well, it's important to note, like as many of your listeners know, like psychedelics have been used by indigenous cultures for thousands of years. And so um, that has happened. 
psychedelics in the West, very new, right? Like it, the, 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 the first reported experiences, Gordon Wasson, you know, in the 1950s, um, Albert Hoffman, uh, that was like kind of like an early exploration into psychedelics. Then, um, you know, in, there was in the 1970s, more of like the therapist community, 60s, 70s, therapist community starting to use psychedelics in the, uh, you know, in the therapeutic context. Uh, then in the research context, like there was some studies that were happening in the next few decades. But in general, um, I think the, the, the world, generally speaking, is not like, it's like when I think of most people that either when I'm walking down the street and I'm looking at like, you know, crossing they're they're not, they're not, they likely have not tried psychedelics are not super informed about them, aware about both uh, their therapeutic use and potential other uses. So, so you're not walking across the street in Venice very often. Then. Ah, nice. I'm on East Sider. There you go. <laughs> um, but, uh, but my point though, is that I believe that, um, I think that as there is more awareness around how psychedelics can be uh, useful when used responsibly, um, and there are more s stories of people who raise their hand and say, I healed a part of myself with MDMA therapy, or I, I you know, um, I became way more creative when I started microdosing or those kinds of stories. I think the, the human nature is such that you hear that story. And then the person who's hearing it is like, Hmm, I have a part of myself that I haven't quite healed yet. And I've been avoiding, like, should I be thinking about that uh, as something for me? And I've seen it. I've seen it happen in the, you know, in the last two years, uh, as I've been really working in the space, uh, People that I wasn't expecting reaching out, asking me questions about, you know, how does ketamine therapy work? And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, do, can you recommend a microdosing regimen or do you have someone you can <laughs> who can uh, give me stuff? And I'm like, no, I, I can't help there. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so so I, I guess my point there is I do believe that there are an increasing number of people that are going to kind of come out of the woodwork sharing how what the positive beneficial relationship that they have to psychedelics such that it will in, uh, in, incline more people to raise their hand and say, you know, I think I could benefit from that. Caveat though, you know, psychedelics are not a panacea that requires more work, especially in the therapeutic context, uh, to be done on working on oneself um, in order to, I think, be a more holistically healed full human being um so yeah i think that's an important thing to note but I do but i do think that fast forward you know 20 years from now i think that there is a very high potential of um culture um and it may not be mainstream culture but i think it'll, i i think the concept of mainstream culture is kind of going away with the sort of distributedness of the internet and culture. But I think that there will be a vast swath of, of people in society that have uh, a relationship with psychedelics. And I think a lot of those people will be looking to it from a therapeutic context. But again, I think uh, I'm open to other contexts as well. Um, and when I think about investing, I see the opportunity to provide capital and strategic support advice to founders that I that I think are um, responsibly expanding access to psychedelic medicine, uh, and so that's kind of yeah that that's how I think about both like the market size and I think about my own interest in getting involved in this space um, and sort of how it came to be was that you know we started the business trip podcast in early 20, uh, 2019, 2020, excuse me basically a month before. COVID. Uh, and the, the first interview was in person, then everything went digital mm. uh, and did a few episodes really to just learn to educate myself and Matthias about how this new space was evolving. There were like a handful of companies at the time. So it was like, hey, let's reach out to founders we think are interesting. 
And it was really just like, let's, let's, let's use this podcast as a platform to educate ourselves, educate others who are interested, uh, and kind of throw our hat in the ring, get involved in this space in some way. Um, which was interesting in that, like, you know, creating a podcast, as I'm sure you experienced, like, it's hard. <laughs> like you got to, there, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle to like do it and do it well. And you got to, if you're editing, um, producing all that, it's a, it's a skill in and of itself. Um, and so, uh, yes, we were doing that for a few months and after, uh, getting a few episodes sort of published and really just further educating ourselves about the way in which we saw the space progressing, we realized that there was an opportunity not just to tell stories, but also to invest in companies that we thought we, we yeah. felt aligned with. So it feel, felt like a very natural sort of evolution uh, and also playing to my own interests uh, as a entrepreneur, investor. I feel like entrepreneur and investor are kind of two sides of one coin. Yeah. Um, and so, but it was my own like first time operating in the investing side versus on the entrepreneurial side. I want to ask more about your ethos around investing. Yeah. And I ask a lot of investors this and everyone... Okay. Um, it's always really interesting to hear what their answer is because, you know, there's obviously such a necessity to do this with integrity yeah. because of the sensitivity of the space and its potential for impact. Like we're talking about, you know, under your, under your in the investing ethos, you have hundreds of millions of people. Yeah. So it's like with great power comes great responsibility, but sure. what do you look at as a formula for success, um, in the startups you're looking for? Like, what is the blend of this is going to be a successful company and they're mm -hmm. going to do it with integrity. What are the pieces? Yeah. So you just mentioned the word integrity. That to me is the number one, my number one value. If I don't sense the integrity there, I'll pass. Uh, and I'm like, it, I just, th I find that getting to know uh, a founder and trusting them and trusting that they're in this for the right reasons. They're in it for the long haul. Um, you know, I, I find there is a nice alignment when people, when a founder has had a really impactful experience with psychedelics as well. It makes sense. You'd think about like they're starting a psychedelic company. It's not always the case. Um, but yeah, I think integrity is my number one thing that I look for in a founder. Um, so that's like the starting place. Um, in addition to that. Well, can you yeah. explain a little bit more? Like, what do you mean by integrity? What do I mean? Like, what are you, are you operate, looking for yeah. how they operate in their life? Are you looking about what kind of initiatives they're taking with, you know, their business? Because everyone does have a different opinion yeah, on sure. what is integrity in the psychedelics. Totally. In, all right. So uh, here's how I think about it. I think about it from a personal moral compass. Like, do, are they, do they, are they moral people? Uh, and that's, you know, that, that, that's applicable to founders in psychedelics or outside of psychedelics. So that would be number one. Uh, number two is uh, I like founders who have a general understanding of the dynamics of and the nuances of the history of psychedelics and the many constituencies that are involved in psychedelics right it's a really multidisciplinary space when you think about it right it's everything going from the indigenous side to the um harm reduction community to the um, the scientists that are involved to, um, the social equity folks, like there, there's a, there's a lot of different parties that are, uh, representing. And so, uh, I'm, I'm really pref prefer to work with founders that have a general understanding of that. You don't always find it, but like in general, it means that they're thinking about the, the nuances in ways that may reflect how they do business. So for example, um, you know, one of the companies we um, invested in, uh, the, the founders are, you know, pledging a fair amount of their own shares uh, to donate to causes in the space that they're aligned with. That to me is like, okay, there's like integrity. They're, they're not just talking the talk, mm -hmm. they're walking the walk. Um, in our own context, we donate a percentage of our profits back to psychedelic nonprofits and um, indigenous communities. Um, so again, it's like, all right, we're like, we want to actually support, you know, uh, constituencies within this space. So I think that's a really good way of, of seeing it. Um, does it mean, and I think an important thing to note there is I do believe that the more people and companies that are, uh, 
operating in that way, it, the more it will influence others to do so. Because I think that the, the space is still early enough that the culture isn't really formed. It's very mm -hmm. amorphous. And so I like most of these companies are going to be in R&D for the next few years before we really figure out what they're making. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, I, I like to amplify those stories on the podcast too, when we see companies that are doing stuff in an interesting way. For example, a recent episode was with, um, Genesee Hertzberg of, um, of the Sage Institute, which is a holistic clinic that in includes ketamine therapy. And she has a sliding scale, uh, structure that basically, uh, optimizes for accessibility such that if there are people that are low income or may not be able to afford the treatment, like she has set up a nonprofit within her business that ultimately allows that expands access. Mm -hmm. So I, like those kinds of things, like my, I, I get excited about and I want to help sort of support, um, whether that's through the podcast or through the investing side of things. So, um, yeah, I, I think I answered the, uh, at least two of the, the two big things that I think about from the integrity side of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I guess, what else do we look for? I mean, just honestly, like yeah. even more, like more matter of fact, like what companies are you really excited about? And you don't need to go into crazy detail. Like obviously sure. people can go to the website, Yeah, we, but just like what particular companies to just, if you had to pick three, like, I'm really excited to see what these, these companies do. Okay. Let's do it. Um, so one company that I am very excited about uh, is called Freedom Biosciences. Uh, it's a very, very, very new company. I don't know when this is going to air, but I think it will be around by then. Hopefully you can uh, share this part of the interview. <laughs> okay. um, and Freedom is unique in that, first of all, it was, it was actually incubated uh, and uh, gotten off the ground by my partner, Dina of SciMed. Uh, and... What's interesting with them is that they are developing a next generation ketamine for formulation and next generation psychedelic uh, compounds in addition to ketamine that do two things. One is they extend the duration of the, uh, of the effect of the compounds. So what that means is, um, you know, there's a window of time after someone has a treatment that then, uh, where there's effectively a, uh, the the ability for the therapeutic kind of window to be open uh and that that that's for a finite amount of days and they believe that they have uh, a formulation that can extend that pretty dramatically mm -hmm. uh and they also have another compound formulation that they're developing that um has basically ketamine but with less abuse liability uh one thing about with ketamine is that it can uh be habit forming and yeah. Um, so I think that they're solving for a really interesting problem and in that if it does so happen that as ketamine therapy becomes more available, that may be, um, you know, kind of, there may be certain segments of the population that could become addicted to it. And so I'm really interested in a company like that, that still provides access to ketamine, but in a safer context. So that's one company that okay. comes to mind. Um, another company that comes to mind is, um, is called Journey Clinical. Uh, Journey Clinical is a company that pairs therapists with psychiatrists uh, and particularly Journey Clinical basically has kind of like a hub of psychiatrists on their platform. What's interesting to me about that company is that there are an increasing number of therapists that are either providing uh, psychedelic therapy or will want to provide psychedelic therapy. And the reality, though, is that those therapists are not necessarily uh, trained in how the, the nuances, at least, uh, you know, in the nuances, but also nor do they have uh, psychiatrists in their own network that can prescribe in a, a responsible way. Because, you know, if a, a psychiatrist that is not familiar with ketamine, for example, they're not going to be able to know the dosing and the protocol and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And so I really like the idea of this company and that they're making it easier for therapists to transition parts of their um, practice and their, their clients to psychedelic therapy, starting with ketamine therapy in the future, it could be MDMA therapy and whatnot, um, by basically being that linkage point between the two. Okay, interesting. Um, and that, yeah. And I, I want to, I hope, I hope one of the third one is one of the ones in digital therapeutics, because I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Like, are you, if you had to pick in a third company that you're excited about specifically in like the psychedelic VR space. Yeah. 
Which one? Well, I mean, Trip is the company we invested in. I don't mm. know if, if you're yep, familiar yep. with them, but like they're um, really cool, uh, great team. Uh, Nanea, the founders, awesome. Uh, all the founders of the companies we invest in, I really love. So, uh, you know, that, that I feel like I hope that goes without saying. Um, but yeah, Trip is really interesting in that it's a VR experience. It's really initially focused around mindfulness um, that basically uh, you, you put on the headset and you're put in this very uh, um, cosmic kind of galactic space where, you know, there's like stars and there's actually one world where there's little mushrooms that are glowing and really calms you down. And they have these, um, the, these guided, their uh, guided sessions without psychedelics, without right psychedelics now. that include breathing and include basically just the more like mindful mindfulness meditation, but they are getting, uh, what they're hearing is that there are an increasing, they have that and then they have some other modules for other types of experiences. They actually have one experience that's called like the machine elves experience. And like you, you're seeing very strange wonky shapes and stuff and you're moving around in this little cosmic space. And, and are you laying down while you're doing this or you can be, yeah. or you can be like up kind of navigating. Yeah, like, yeah, okay. yeah. But you're in the, you, you don't want to be walking. You're like, you're, you're situated, you're seated right. or laying down. You don't want to be uh, going down Abbot Kenny. You don't want to be going down. Okay, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. And so what's interesting with them is that they are, um, they're, they're being used. Some of their experiences are already being used by clinics to basically like, uh, help people get comfortable with, uh, like to both calm themselves and get comfortable with the psychedelic experience. Kind of like what I was talking about before. Yeah. And so I think that there's like a huge opportunity for them to really expand on the types of experiences that they could uh, built into the platform. They actually recently uh, made a, um, a kind of like a short film, I guess you could say, about Ram Das's first psilocybin experience. Cool. And it was freaking cool. Uh, it starts with Ram Das kind of giving a talk. Uh, it, it's pulled from a, a talk that he gave about the experience. And then they added all the visuals and you start in this office, kind of supposed to replicate like his office. And there you see his degrees from Harvard. And when he was more Richard Alpert and wasn't yet Ramdas, and then he kind of starts to talk about um, how at that point in his life he was making decisions that were um, I don't know, I'd say more like status driven decisions. Uh, with you know, he had a lot of honor, a lot of degrees from important universities, um, and so he then ex- describes his psilocybin experience, where you know uh, a- a- he talks about taking it, and as he does, the furniture in the office starts to like move in a very like trippy way kind of like the a mushroom experience and like literally you start to see the couch kind of like and then all of a sudden boom you're blasted off into like uh space and Whoa. yeah there's like a you're kind of in this like weird tunnel and he continues speaking and then at the end of his uh, him recounting the experience it ends on this really beautiful note where he repeats uh his mantra which is i am loving awareness and then you see his face in the stars. And it's wow. Like, yeah. So okay, I have to more, go watch that more immediately of that, after. More of that. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, there's so much that people are doing. I'm so excited about all of these companies. And, yeah. Um, something you said I, I want to go back to because sure. I don't want to lose this point. So for context, have you read the book about Immortality Key? I have not. I've listened to a podcast episode about it and it's on my list. But So you know the gist. Yes, I know the gist, okay. but I have not read it. And you don't need to know the, you don't need to have read it for this okay. question, yeah, but, yeah. um, What's it's on a page fa- 246. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it's a fascinating book and yeah. you know, the one sentence explainer of the book is yeah. that the origin of most Western religion mm-hmm. came from psychedelic rituals being a mm-hmm. part of those experiences. Yeah. And, you know, after I read the book and was having several different conversations, around and you said something about the need to understand the origin Mm -hmm. and my actual original path in life. Now I won't go too far down this rabbit hole, but I was going to be a a sex therapist. Mm -hmm. I was super fascinated by human sexuality. This Mm -hmm. is like, you know, pre gay rights being legalized. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the things that I learned in a lot of my classes that I took was that, you know, pre religion, essentially like before Jesus Christ was born, there was no Mm -hmm. establishment of sexuality. Homosexuality was not a thing. Heterosexuality was not a thing. And so Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and a lot of the philosophers that we derive, a lot of conservative 
you know, modern democracy from Mm -hmm. very conservative Mm -hmm. original principles Mm -hmm. actually spent most of their time writing about their sexual relationships Mm -hmm. with other men, oftentimes even little boys, which is just a fascinating fact Mm -hmm. in and of itself. And I was thinking to myself, you know, if more people were to understand how sexuality evolved, Mm -hmm. we would have such a different viewpoint on, you know, sexuality in our, in our modern world in a very similar way. The mortality key kind of paints a similar picture where if you understand how psychedelics are being used, you know, if you, if you believe everything that the book says, and it's, it's such a well-researched book, it's really, really fascinating. You know, it would be such a different understanding because we're piecemealing. That's how we do in Western society. We pick something up from Ayurveda Mm -hmm. and we bring it into the modern world. Like, and there's not the full picture. And that's what a lot of people, a lot of people actually that don't understand psychedelics think that they just were created in the sixties mm. and then there were just this thing and then it got shut down mm-hmm. and they don't have to understand the full picture. And I just kind of want to know your, your thoughts on that of like, how important is it for you, everything we're putting forth with education and your podcast, like yeah. really understanding the full picture yeah. rather than just like, here's a new tr- sexy, trendy subject that we're building companies around. Totally. I think it's critical uh i you know i i think about it in my own context of just being a student being open to learning and realizing that like there's just so much to learn and in this space even like you know uh i'm very involved in it but i also recognize that there's like there's there's such a rich history that um i'm personally really interested in continuing to educate myself on um and i think it's Yeah, I think it's really important and it kind of gets almost to, it's not really the integrity point I was making before, but like, I do think that like, you can't just, I don't, I don't want to say you can't uh, because anyone can do anything, but I don't think I choose not to, um, just be involved in the business capacity because I feel like there's just these other dimensions to the space that can actually inform uh, my, myself, uh, about both being a better person, but also just the ways in which this whole space can operate. And so what that means, okay, what are ap- like practical ways? Well, that means like reading important books. That means attending, uh, events, virtual events, Chakruna in particular, when I think about just the, the more, uh, indigenous uses of these medicines, like they, they provide a ton of great content. Um, that means if you feel called to it and aligned, supporting specific causes, um, and yeah, just kind of committing to learn, uh, about the history and I'm personally, uh, optimistic that there will be more content that is accessible about these things. I think it's really important. You got to meet people where they're at. And so it's, you know, it's, it's hard to, there needs to be resources that exist, books, talks, et cetera, that are approachable. And so on a very personal level, to be honest, I do think over a long enough period of time, I would actually be involved. I would like to be involved in projects that involve storytelling, um, of, uh, indigenous wisdom and knowledge. Maybe that's a podcast. Maybe that's going down to the Amazon for uh, a few months. Maybe that's interviewing people in the spiritual realm. Maybe that's interviewing people in the spiritual realm. Yeah. Um, but also like, you know, uh, a fantastic book that I loved, uh, is braiding sweetgrass. Um, about more of a Native American uh, history. Uh, it's written by a, a botanist, and it just each each chapter is kind of a short, you know, uh, 10, 20 pages, beautifully written. She's a poet, a botanist, and uh, really a historian of uh, Native American history. And uh, it, the, the, the book should be a movie, like straight up. And I'm like, now I live in LA, I feel like, Maybe at some point I'll meet the right person, chat with them about it. I don't know, get, get it on screen. So yeah, um, more stories, more stories both need to be told. And I'm interested in, in reading more stories and learning more. This is a, is a really good segue to my next question because yeah. in, in a very similar way, you know, I've listened to a lot of content in the psychedelic space over the last few yeah. years, but the most compelling thing for me personally is my, my personal experience and the experience of my closest people and my community and hearing their own transformational, transformational stories. And Mm. something we were just talking about before we started recording is the importance of telling these stories, but doing it in an elevated way that really helps rewrite the narrative that was so incorrectly bestowed upon psychedelics. Yeah. 
And so my question is, you know, what is your personal relationship with psychedelics? Like whatever you want to share, how do you, how do you integrate them into your life or have you, and you know, kind of what's, what's the lessons you've learned? Yeah. So I like to bucket, I think there's three buckets, how I think about my relationship. There's the, uh, there's the creative bucket. There is the therapeutic bucket and there's the consciousness exploration bucket. That's my relationship. So, um, and, and I think that each of them have different contexts, uh, and, I think that they're each, yeah, for me, really valuable. Uh, on the creative side, I think about um, experiences with both microdosing uh, as well as macrodosing um, of compounds like psilocybin or LSD that um, can, I mean, again, we, we know that these things can induce real creative states and also problem solving. And so, um, you know, uh, I've, I, I like to make art that's inspired by those experiences. I like to, um, I'm, I'm big on words. I collect words. I have a label maker right over there. Um, and you I, just carry it around I, with I you. Car- I carry it around. I label things. I give people stickers. Um, wait, wait, just like throughout the day, you carry this label maker around? Most days, yeah. Okay, so can you give me an example of, of how you would use it? Like you meet someone. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, they're uh, a really kind, happy person. You just put a happy label and stick it on them? An example would be um, at Burning Man this year, uh, I was speaking to somebody who uh, I biked by this camp that had <laughs> uh, bike seats, that bike seat covers, like really fuzzy, nice bike seat covers and stopped. I didn't have a bike seat cover. Got one, was chatting with this guy uh, whose camp it was really nice. And he was like, yeah, you know, I find this is nice for its instant gratification. And I was like, one moment. And I just go... <laughs> write it out. I give him the sticker. And he was just like, what the, he was like very confused. Like, how did I have an instant gratification? I wrote the word instant gratification in the sticker and I gave it to him. And it's just moments like that. that You're I, documenting little moments in time. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And so, um, yeah. Um, I mean, a little, it's, it's out of reach, but I have it. Uh, oh, dang, I would, that would be amazing if you could make me a sticker on the I, spot. I, we, we'll, we'll find the right moment. Um, <laughs> Wait, it, I think it, we're getting it. Yes, but it, it needs to be inspired by part of the conversation, oh, okay, okay. but I'll have it in arm's reach. All right, so, so just in good. case, just in case something inspiring comes up. Yes. Now um, I want to be super offended if you aren't inspired by anything. No, like, it's ah, all good. Nothing was, nothing was sticker worthy. I mean, worst case, I just write multi. Yeah, right, worst case. Um, so yeah, so the, there's the creative side. Um then the, on the therapeutic side, that can manifest in a few ways. I mean, there's the, I've had, you know, ceremonial experiences that have been really valuable from a processing standpoint. And I think an important thing to note in my own personal mental health and, and healing journey, if you will, is that like, I, I, as I mentioned before, I, I think that psychedelics are a valuable tool, but they're, they're, they're not the panacea. Mm-hmm. And so you know, I personally do a lot of journaling. I love to just get my thoughts on paper. It gets me more, uh, I feel like in control control is a weird word cause yep. you're never fully in control. Uh, but it, you know, once you name it, once you label it, you, you just, it, I think it's a really calming, uh, thing for the psyche. And so, um, so yeah, so I, I have basically like a daily journaling practice. And what I have found is that that paired in with certain uh, more the, the psychedelic experiences, uh, that, that can be either in ceremony or with a microdose, it, they pair really well together. And so, for example, um, uh, I did a month of microdosing, uh, psilocybin mushrooms, and I was working with a coach, uh, where we basically were checking in on a, on a weekly basis. And, him giving me really good feedback and perspective. And it was in that period that a few things happened. One was I really was able to list out all of my fears that at least I I was conscious about and make a commitment to myself to make friends with those fears and like not let them dictate my life. So it was really powerful because, uh, just, I think that the the, 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 the softness of the microdose in the background kind of inspired that kind of uh, decision to do so. Mm-hmm. And 
I felt it from like more of the soul level, like this is what I meant to do. Um, and then also in that period, I, that experience, I had my first self love moment, uh, as I like to think about it, where, uh, how old were you when you had, uh, not a a year, a year and a half ago. Um, and I, I, what I, what I'm, so basically what, what I realized working with this coach was that he made this point, which was really, uh, hit me hard. Uh, it was really poignant, which was that, uh, I, he was noted that I can be harder on myself than on anyone else often. And I was like, wow, that's true. Like I'm really nice to people. I'm actually really kind of very, I, I like to think of myself as being a thoughtful person. And yet there were some instances where I would just like get on myself and I was like, how did that come to be? And I think what's really interesting, you know, what we know about psilocybin in particular is it decreases activity in our prefrontal cortex and, Basically, we have a we we're able to kind of see ourselves from a more objective perspective, and so I was able to see how I was treating myself from a third, like from someone else's perspective, in a mm. way where I was like, I I can do better, and I basically at, the, at that moment decided to have like more of a, a self love uh, routine or ritual. So in the morning, I have like a I do a daily stretch, uh, some yoga flow. Uh, at, at some intention setting. And as part of it, I just, I hug myself for like 30 seconds, minute. Feels great. Uh, like even doing it for yourself. And in that process, I, I've, uh, want to do it yeah it's it's beautiful and you know it's a bit, it's always it's available. Nice here, yeah. It's nice. And like, you can, you can do the tap, <laughs> you know, great. you can, you know, whatnot. And so, um, yeah, I attribute that awareness to that experience. I don't know if it would have happened otherwise. Um, and I actually, I don't know. I feel like there's this concept. I used to think that the concept of self-love was kind of like a live, laugh, love, like right, right. thing. But I, <laughs> then I was like, wait, no, 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 This is like a thing. And what's in, really interesting about it is I shared that experience with Matthias, who uh, has a tattoo right who's here. Your, who's your who's co-founder? my co-founder. And he has a tattoo right here of arms hugging himself. Wow. So uh, I actually think that maybe there's something to this. Like, is this something that more people have not experienced and may experience and could benefit from experiencing that, you know, I think psychedelics can help give us that nudge. Um, yeah. And then, and then the third bucket is more of the, the consciousness, uh, the third bucket of like my own, my own relationship is the consciousness, uh, exploration. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, I, I'm a believer in, uh, Aldous Huxley's concept around the brain kind of just being this redu- reduction valve, kind of making sense of this world, not just the brain, but some, our senses. Um, but there's a lot of intelligence that exists out there and a lot of information that we're just like not privy to really understanding. Some of that may be in the spirit world, maybe in other dimensions. Uh, and that's my belief. Uh, and so I think that you know, what we know with psychedelics is that they can quite reliably um, deactivate parts of ourselves so that we feel more connected to the, the, the universe and the cosmic nature of things. And, uh, and so, yeah, I think it's a very interesting tool to enable me to, you know, question the nature of reality, but also just like, I don't know, like, the seven days a week, five days working, two days not working. Like, why does, does that serve us still? Like, I don't know. I don't. I don't think so. Like, well, and it goes back to the origin. Like, when did that start? Yeah, and why? Yeah, I mean, probably like, it's a combination of like religiosity and agrarian roots. I think I'd be so curious who created the first weekend. Who created? I mean, right? We gotta go talk to that person. It, it may be up there. Right? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. It, it, I, I, so to that point, it's like just pondering big questions and making me think about things from, you know, what I like to think of like a first principle perspective. Right. Um, and so, yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's a really beautiful answer. And mm-hmm. I like those buckets. I'm going to try to think about what my yeah. buckets are. Cause sure. I, you know, I definitely have an answer to the question, but I like the idea of segmenting it. Yeah. And I've, you know, one more question for you about microdosing versus macrodosing sure. and then we'll do a quick little rapid fire question round and then we'll, we'll close it out but um specifically on the microdosing versus macrodosing i've asked yeah. other people on the podcast this as well 
And I give you a little context before we started recording. But you know what? There's we're at this really interesting point in federal policy where mm. laws are being made around psychedelics like psilocybin, regardless of dose. And so we're having all these laws being formed around psychedelics at service centers for larger macro doses. But in a way, you know, it's obviously you can't, this is not apples to apples comparison, but it's like taking one sip of wine versus drinking the whole bottle. One um, creates a completely different effect. And with psychedelics, microdosing is being used by hundreds of people, mm -hmm. you know, thousands, just in, in my community alone, you know, thousands and thousands across the United States. We yeah. don't even have data on that for people that are in this healthy ish, normal category who mm -hmm. really is everyone always, you know, has their own stuff they're dealing with, but it's in this non-clinical outcomes, so to speak. And it's changing so many people's lives. Yeah. It's changed my life. You obviously just shared a really beautiful experience you had with microdosing mm -hmm. yet. We're being, you know, we're making laws right now, like macrodose at a service center for someone who is ha or has severe treatment resistant PTSD um, is the same as you taking a microdose for enhanced creativity or whatever it is. Sure. And I would just love to hear your thoughts on that right now on the full legal, you know, I've, we're working on something with a, with a group of really awesome people around looking at what it would look like yeah. to push forward for microdosing to be separated on those bills. Sure. And just what are your thoughts on microdosing legalization? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, one thing that's good to note is whether micro, not whether micro macro, but we are seeing a decriminalization taking place in a bunch of, you know, uh, states and cities, municipalities around the United States. So yeah. there's, there's momentum there. Um, in terms of the differences between the two or how I think about it from like a policy standpoint, um, a few things come to mind. Um, you know, I, I similarly know many people who have benefited dramatically from microdosing. Um, and so there's anecdotal evidence. There's not what, what we need more of is more clinical evidence. And I say we need that in the sense that this is how our this, our society and our um, government and our regulatory bodies operate like they need to look at the effectiveness, both the effectiveness in potentially allowing us to use it safely. Right. That's a, that's an important foundation. And then also the, the therapeutic effectiveness. And to my knowledge, there are not any, you know, um, placebo controlled, double blind, large scale studies on microdosing yet. Mm -hmm. I think that will change. It's starting to happen. It's starting to happen. There's companies that are initiating those studies and universities too. So it's starting to happen. But I think that's one thing that comes to mind as uh, something that will, I think, be really helpful to really help us assess like what are the long-term effects um, and, and kind of, yeah, g give more you know, scientifically, clinically validated right. information. So that's sort of one part of the spectrum. Um, I think that, I mean, I think an interesting conversation to be had is like, where should the, should, should, uh, I don't know, is, is like, is the microdose safer than the macrodose? Um, safe is a weird word there because like you could argue that on the macro dose, there's actually probably a higher risk of an incident of somebody having an experience that may be adverse if they're not in the right set and setting than the micro dose. The micro dose is kind of like chilling, right? It's like operating right. very subtly. Well, the idea um, is it's sub perceptual. So you're not supposed to, yes. I'm more, t I'm talking about, you know, micro dose and how we're defining micro dose. Sure. Or, you know, not, not myself, but just how it's widely accepted is, yeah. you know, 10 to 20% max of yeah. a normal dose of yeah. of you know psilocybin in this case particularly yeah, yeah. focused on but yeah totally i mean i guess though to answer the question um i think that i could foresee there being <clears throat> policy changes that uh allow for you know whether it's the decriminalization that's usually the way that these that these things start of things like microdosing um in in the foreseeable future i i just i do think that there should be there will need to be more clinical evidence yeah no d definitely to to actually drive policy change. to drive policy because we know yeah because like the politicians they're not 
trying the, most of them are not trying these things. Therefore in their mind, you know, it's like, they don't know what the experience is like. Right. It's right. And so they're not thinking about it like, Oh, it's just a sub perceptual amount. It's like, in their mind, it's like, you're still taking the thing. Right. So it's like, you got to meet them where they're at. Yeah, definitely. I think that, you know, we, we know that it works yeah. because of our own personal experience and experience of, of the people around us. Yeah. But I'm just really excited to see this space progress and hopefully, um, you know, be a part of m moving forward actual public policy on this. Yeah. It's really interesting. So I have three more questions for you. These are, you could have much longer answers than we have time for. Okay. So we'll try to keep them kind of short. Um, I asked, I asked someone this a few weeks ago and it reminded me that's like one of my favorite questions to ask people. Okay. If you had to go back and teach a class yeah. in school yeah. that you think everyone needs to know, ha. as it relates to psychedelic or broader, mm. what would you teach? Well, I think important to note that I, I think that the whole education system that we've inherited, uh, should need, needs to be, should be reconsidered. Right. Um, I think that, you know, the four year college education happening when we're 18, I think is a reflection of the fact that, uh, like of the university system when Cambridge was formed in the year a thousand. And like, that's kind of why we have those systems today. Um, so in general, I think that I kind of want to nuke the whole education system. Um, that would be the class, how to nuke the, education how to nuke system. the education system. Um, <laughs> so what would be the class that I think is worth teaching? Um, I mean, my two things come to mind. Uh, one is around meditation and mindfulness. Like that's a discipline and training that is required to do it well. And I think if you can learn that at a really young age, it can be tremendously valuable. Um, they kind of already have nap time. So why not just like add a little meditation in there, you know, swap it out. Um, yeah, that comes to mind. And then you know, I think that there's you can some, have an elective as well. I think like um, relationship management and like emotional regulation, um, mm -hmm. right? I think that it's something that I feel like at a younger ages you only get exposure to if you're like a, uh, get in trouble and then you have to go see a counselor or whatnot. But I think that like I, I think a lot of this does draw on more Eastern concepts. But like, yeah, being being mindful of like understanding of the nuances of our emotions, being able to label our emotions, being able to also understand the difference between the thinking mind and the kind of the heart, so to speak. And like that, that those dynamics, um, I, I personally find to be really valuable and, um, you know, I think make me a, a, a happy person. So I think that, but like, there's no education on that. Like there's no, there's no school that to my knowledge that is teaching that at a younger not age. Not widespread for sure. Not widespread, yeah. but like at, at younger ages in particular. Uh, Cause I think that if like that could be implemented, if that could be educated, if we can learn about those things at a younger age, then like those young people become older people and then they have kids that become young people. And then we start to have generational shifts in that way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, I mean, I'm not like a child psychologist. You may run up into some issues around just like the fact that kids are like, you know, very uh, excitable and it's hard for them to sit still for extended periods of time. But I do know there are like, you know, uh, nonprofits. And there's one in particular that does like meditation for um, students uh, in at-risk communities. And, and I think that like, yeah, I guess what I'm saying is more of like a Eastern philosophical school. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Would be rad. And I think, you know, to bring it full circle and to bring yeah. it back to, you know, the, the purpose of, of this podcast is to bring people on that are passionate about mushrooms, both functional and psychedelic, sure. um, help educate and associate them also in the same category. Mm -hmm. And one of the most interesting points that we've come across in the psychedelic space that actually is one of the main things that converts a non-believer to a believer uh -huh. is understanding that the brain of someone of someone that, who is meditating actually looks very similar to the brain of someone mm -hmm. who is, who has psilocybin or another psychedelic in their system. Yeah. Same, same brain scans. Yeah. And so I think that's a really um, key point. You can get there a bunch of different ways, meditation yeah. and psychedelics alike. Yeah. 
also one thing to note that I've, uh, I've experienced, but also I've been reading about increasingly, which is like the, the way into more of the, the, uh, spiritual or psychic realm is actually through presence. That's actually, it's, it's only by being very present that you can even open yourself up to it. So it's, that's like another edge to, to, that would be the elective. That would be the elective. Right. Let's see. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. I love that. Um, all right. So two more questions for you. We didn't get to everything, so we'll have to do another one, but, um, who would you love to have dinner with and talk to them about psychedelics? Mm. That you have not already had dinner with. Well, talk to them about psychedelics. Um, that's interesting. We could also pivot the question: yeah, yeah, Who would yeah, you like yeah. to do psychedelics with? No, no. Let me <laughs> let me think. It's an interesting question. Um, or does someone? I'll say that literally the first person that came to my mind. Yeah. Because that maybe is the best answer. Is like it was Joe Biden. I don't mm-hmm. know. It was like politician. Like I know. There's some people like Floor from Nana. Um, yeah, she's great. She wants to do 5-MEO or, or wants to sit for the Pope on a 5-MEO DMT experience. Like there's something to like the, I guess that's more on the, reli- the religious side. And my mind went to the political side. Just because, No, but the trickle down effect yeah, of how we make policy. It's the trickle down effect of exactly. And so, I don't know, Joe. That's a great, no, that's it. a great answer. <laughs> let's go. Um. Okay, so what is next for you? Like what's next for you and Simon business trip obviously is an amazing podcast. Everyone needs to go listen to it. You guys do such a good job with it. Um, what's, what's the most exciting next six months look like for you? So the next six months and beyond, um, going to continue pumping out episodes of business trip. Um, we've been doing once one episode every, I don't know, three weeks, let's say. Uh, so we have some really good episodes lined up. Um, so that's part one. And then on the investing side with SciMed, we have both a fund and a syndicate. And, um, you know, we're, we're looking to invest in more companies that we feel that alignment with. Um, I think that the, the space is going to continue to grow. Uh, I think that, um, I actually think this decade could be known as like a healing decade or like a decade of like, uh, of, of people both starting with more acute cases of people who have like really more severe situations, but on down to people who realize that they have maybe generalized anxiety or things of that nature that are going to look to heal those parts of themselves. And so, um, so yeah, so we're, so basically actively investing in companies, uh, that we're excited about, um, that's a very tactical answer, I guess. Um, but I think beyond that, you know, uh, yeah, I, I, I think about like my part of my, my, my purpose is to help this movement succeed in the ways I know how. Uh, and to me, that means storytelling through the podcast. And it means investing in companies that um, I think can make a meaningful impact on the world. So um, the more of that, what else? I don't know. Uh, yeah. So that's a really stacked deck. Yeah, though. it's a that's stacked a, deck. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I, I think what I'll also say, though, on a, on a very personal level is like, I find that like, I don't know, I, I'm, what I'm starting to find is that I have parts of myself, some parts that are, can be called shadow selves and some parts of, uh, uh, that are, that I'm, I'm still exploring and learning about and, and making friends with, so to speak. And so what's also on my own personal docket is to like continue doing the work, you know, continue, mm. uh, healing and learning about parts of myself. Um, and, um, just that journey. It's, it's a, it's a journey and I'm enjoying it. Uh, and yeah, that, that's, that's what's up. I love it. I love <laughs> yeah. it. Um, I also love the way you answer questions. I like how you bucket them. Mm. Um, so you're a good co- host and, and good question answer Great. naturally. Um, okay. Actual last question yeah. is what is the single most important lesson that psychedelics have taught you in a very concise way? We are all connected. All right. I love it. Thank you so much for coming on, Greg. I'm excited to continue, you know, to dive deeper with you and, and watch everything you're doing. Thank you. And we will link up everywhere where people can find you Mm -hmm. online, SciMed, Business Trip FM, and more to come.
thank you. Uh, this was a blast. And uh, the feeling is, is uh, mutual on interviewing. I think you're a great interviewer. And I'm going to give you your label, which is a label I like to do. So you, A-L-L-I, is that right? Yep. Okay, so I like to do this label in general just to like, to, so that people know what's up. So this is For people name. that are just listening, Greg has this like very uh, futuristic looking label maker that he just, he just punched mm-hmm. out a label for me. Wow. Your phone that now has your, your. Amazing. Yeah. I love it. Right next to my super mush label. Right next to your super mush label. I love it. I'm honored. Well, thank you so much. Yes. And, um, well, yeah, we'll chat about everything else in the next episode. Thanks for coming that on. That was good. Thanks, Ellie. Right. Thanks for diving into the multiverse with us. If you're interested in being a future guest on the show, sponsorship, partnership, or you're just mushroom curious, we're always looking to expand our mycelium network. Find us on Instagram at multiverse or online at yourmultiverse.com. See you next week.